Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pogoshnik. Thank you so much for listening to us. On the other end of the tin cannon string, I'd like to bring in the, uh, the contributor to the Daily Norseman, along with various other blogs, and seems to be one of the more popular people being interviewed this uh, uh, this off season for training camp. Uh, welcome, Arif Hassan. How you doing, Arif? I'm uh, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I've been on a been on a couple of uh, radio appearances now, uh, which is you know always nice. I feel like you can just put that on your business card, like media gadfly. Ooh, yeah, I like the sound of that. Just just add like more and more. You know, like it, I mean, people have mentioned too is like like oh, Arif is on this radio show and this radio show. When's Norse Code coming? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, well, actually, we, we've tried how many times? We tried three times, or did we try four times to do a show? I think, this is, I think this is our fourth attempt, so we have tried three previous times, uh, either right before or during training camp to get Norse Code up and running, and it just it just hasn't worked out. The only time uh, that we could have found a way to circumvent the hotel's weird... Um, you know, security that prevents us from doing uh, from doing the calls. Uh, I had to bail for different reasons, so it's just like it's just been nuts. Yep. So next year we're going to uh, with the money that is raised for the for the Mankato trip, we're just going to get a MiFi and just like say screw it to the radio to the uh, to the hotels wireless. We're doing our own. We're going to do it Bill O'Reilly style. Fuck it, we're doing it live. And uh, we're just going to move on from there. Uh, so apologies for the delay in the show. However, we have quite a big show for you. Uh, first things first, however, we do want to mention that our three-year anniversary came and went on uh, July 18th. Yeah, so We've, that would have uh, been that would have been fun to yeah. <laughs> that would have been fun to talk about in July. <laughs> July 18th, 92 episodes later, and uh, here we are. That's including all of the two-parters that uh, that we've done uh, for the show. So, so 92 is the total number of episodes we've put out there, not, like, episode number 92? Correct. We are on episode 76 at the moment. Hey, that means we can uh, pop our 100 cherry twice. We can. We're going to milk that thing for all it's worth. Special donations. If you give $100, you can either co-host the show, or you can go down to Florida, go down to Tampa, and get a free drink in the bar that Kyle works in. I, I agree. That's, yep, that's exactly what can happen. Yes, that, all of your dreams can come true. <laughs> Don't you want your dreams to come true? I want your dreams to come true, so give generously to Norse Code. <laughs> Uh, you can also please uh, consider donating to the Lead the Way Foundation uh, at uh, chadgreenway.org. We did, however, have uh, two donations come in, one from Andrew Williams of Brooklyn, New York, for, quote, for stuff and stuff. Thank you. I like that. Thank you very much for the stuff and stuff uh, donation, $20. Thank you very much to keep the, uh, keep the lights on. Uh, he also had uh, donated to Lead the Way, so thank you, uh, thank you to Andrew. Uh, Phil Smith... Of and I promise I am going to destroy the name here. Uh, Congleton, Congleton, sure. It's uh, in Cheshire in the UK. Uh, Ten dollars donation for the UK to keep on the lights on. Thank you so much, Phil, for uh, for donating. If you would like to donate to Norse Code and make all of your dreams come true, you can do so at Norse Code Podcast dot com. There's a donation link right at the bottom of the page. Now, before we uh, get into the actual news of the day, uh, there's one more thing we'd like to mention, the Norse Code Fantasy Football League, which uh, has been filled. Thank you guys so much for, uh, uh, for your enthusiasm. Uh, we had enough people volunteer, we could have actually done three leagues of 12. It was, a, uh, it was quite a turnout. Uh, thanks again. We have contacted those who uh, will be a part of it. Uh, we have put on the um, we have a couple of alternates as well, and we are just figuring out the the very basics of uh, who is going or how many QBs and how many wide receivers. Otherwise, we are set, 
and I have entered in the negative 25 points for missed field or for for missed uh, extra points. Yeah, so the league is being run as it should. Yes, <laughs> this 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 is happening. This is this is on. Uh, also, the uh, because nothing is more annoying than listening to someone talk about their fantasy league. Uh, the recaps for the league will actually be done after the uh, disclaimer at the very end of the show. So for weeks one through fourteen or fifteen of the NFL season, uh, at the very end of the show, after the disclaimer, I will do a quick recap of the show. If you would like to a hear how your team went, or b make fun of Kyle for how badly his team did, uh, or c if you just want to live vicariously through our fun. Uh, however, if a extra point is in fact missed, it will be brought up during the show. You will just have to deal with that. Eat it. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. <laughs> that's fair like because sense. this is our show, so that sounds great. <laughs> it's fair because we're making up the rules of engagement. Therefore, fair. <laughs> this sounds frighteningly familiar. <laughs> this is going to turn into FIFA or a terrorist organization or FIFA really quickly. <laughs> One of the two three, yes, for sure. <laughs> One of the two three is going to happen. So, we had a couple of things to, uh, to touch talk about, uh, kind of headlines going into or during training camp. Uh, first things first, Blair Walsh got paid, son! Uh, yeah, no, I guess I guess he signed a, a new contract. I, I don't know if I would, like, say you got paid, like, there was no double D in paid for a double dose of the pimpin', but, yeah, you got, you got a pretty penny. I I want to talk about the contract so badly, but I want to talk about the double D and pimping more. <laughs> well, if you get if you get paid well, there's two D's and paid two D's for a double D uh, a double dose of the pimping. Did you learn something today, kids? Because I learned something today. It's not original. I mean, if you've watched Idiocracy, it's like pretty clearly in the rules. You know, what I remember from Idiocracy is that plants need electrolytes to live. They, they crave uh, sorry, electrolytes. It's, 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 what, it's what they crave. Yeah. Yeah. And that the future president is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, I've got no worries about the future presidency. No, no. Future presidents are taken care of as far as we're concerned. Uh, the contract is reportedly worth... Uh, Fourteen uh, up to fourteen million dollars. The four-year deal with five point two five million in guarantees makes him one of the top five kickers in terms of pay grade in the league. Yeah. And so good for uh, yeah. good for Blair Walsh. Let's hope he doesn't miss any extra points. <laughs> See, it all comes back to that. I think that's the only reason you mentioned it. it. So you could it, circle it, it back. <laughs> that's. That's, that's exactly it, actually. Uh, news that we want to bring up uh, also is, uh, let's just go to Josh Robinson real quick, who, uh, who, went, the, who went on the PUP this uh, uh, over, uh, over training camp. Would you like to uh, talk about uh, Josh Robinson real quick? Well, uh, I don't think he, uh, he's been pupped quite yet. Um, now that a... Uh, oh, no, 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 yeah, he did. Um, that's my bad. Um, yeah, so he hasn't been season-pupped which is different than, like, training camp pupped. Um, so preseason pup list means you can attend team meetings, work with trainers, etc. He just can't practice with the team. He can watch them do a walkthrough, but he can't even be on the field when they're in pads uh, in case he, like, watches something painful and gets injured in the process. That's sort of like watching, uh, sort of like getting the concussion and, like, you can be in the hallway when they're eating, but you're not allowed to actually eat. <laughs> it's, it's exactly like that, yes. Um, but yeah, so so he's popped, uh, which means we don't see him. Uh, that He could be removed from the pup list at any time. Um, if he finishes uh, the preseason, uh, and that's like all for it, so it's not a training camp, it's like the entire preseason, because the preseason lasts longer than training camp does. Um, if he finishes the preseason on the pup list, he can be removed. He can be moved to the regular season pup list, which uh, I would not be um, surprised if that if that's what ended up happening. 
I think it gives you about six six weeks where he sits out, he doesn't count against the roster, uh, and then you've got three more weeks to figure out whether or not he's going to keep practicing um, with the team. If he doesn't practice, he stays on the pup list. If he does practice, you remove him from the pup list um, within three weeks of the day. So actually, so you could choose not to practice him for a week, then he practices, and then you get another three weeks to remove him from the pup list. So it gives you a lot of leeway, and you don't have to use your one-time only short-term IR designation uh, in order to save yourself a roster spot. So I, I think that's just what's going to end up happening to him. Um, and so that gives, uh, that gives the Vikings a little bit more leeway, and then they can have like seven cornerbacks on the roster or whatever they feel like doing. Who cares? Well, you say seven, but I, I feel like I would be not doing my job if I forgot to mention that uh, we could just pick up Chris Cook as an extra body. I mean, he knows the defense and is, and is an exceptional corner out there. I mean, he's available. The 49ers cut him well, this week. Well, he, he knows the players on the defense. I, I guess he had a playbook <laughs> before he got cut from the Vikings. So, in theory, he's aware of the defense. He's 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 more aware of the te- that the team exists. Like he's seen hats. Yeah. But but otherwise, there's there's not much like there's not much going on. Also of note is that uh, both Arif and I combined have the same number of interceptions in a pro game as uh, as Chris Cook does. Yeah, definitely, and uh, and I'm I'm proud of that. Yeah, no, definitely. The 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 have the same number. Of of interceptions as a, a second round pick, someone who's uh, who's started twenty nine games, who's appeared in forty games. That's that's impressive. I think uh, on both of our parts. No, I actually want that and chiseled into my tombstone that I had the same number of interceptions uh, as Chris Cook. I feel like that it might raise a couple of eyebrows to like the people who are like cutting the grass or whatever. Like, wait, did he play in the NFL? Oh no! Oh, Chris Cook just sucked. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Well, that's too bad. I did like that for whatever reason, every single sports media outlet decided to include Chris Cook being cut on their ticker. Yeah, no, it's great. It's just like, yeah, he's the, the one guy. piece of news. <laughs> yeah, the one piece of news out of San Francisco was that Chris Cook was cut. Like the only thing that happened in San Francisco that day. It's crazy because... Like, no murders, no crime, just Chris Cook got cut. Well, it's also crazy because San Francisco has this problem in terms of retaining players. <laughs> and, and and even after, like, they had, like, three of their best players retire and another one sort of go on a leave of absence and then some other players retire and they've got, like, this new coach and they've got some injuries. E- even after all of that, they're just like, yeah, we don't really need Chris Cook. Like, we, we <laughs> lost, our, we lost right both now. of our quarterbacks in free agency. We're not sure what to do about safety. Uh, but we could just do without this dude. Yeah, but fuck that guy. <laughs> fuck that guy in particular. They even had, like, they even had two injury skaters, like, the day they cut him. And, and they were just like, nope. Really, if you're injured, that means we have to pay you, and we don't want to pay you anyway, we just realized, so please go. As it turns out, you can just go through that door, and we won't have to deal with you again. (laughs) So yeah, so the Ravens are looking at him, which is weird, because they are typically very good at evaluating cornerbacks. Uh, Yeah, so we'll find out how that goes. Well, you know, Bryant McKinney turned out to be some sort of genius in uh, uh, when he was over in uh, uh, when he was over in Baltimore. Yeah, when they Maybe they ripped just him away from him. Miami. Yeah. <laughs> no, when they ripped him away from the buffet. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's precisely that's precisely what happened. He had a pretty great playoff performance, and then he uh, didn't come back. <laughs> then he found himself in trouble. It was great. Uh, let's let's move on to uh, to Anthony Barr, which is kind of a newer development. Uh, he is considered out at the moment with uh, with knee inflammation. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but he hasn't actually practiced with the team so far uh, this preseason. Is that right? Uh, that's not quite accurate. So he's taking, uh, so he's 
Van did a bunch of walkthroughs, uh, and he took part in individual drills uh, throughout training camp except for the last couple of days. Uh, and before two days ago when we saw him not take a single rep in walkthroughs, he did actually participate, I believe, in two practices, like team drills, where he participated in, in team practices, scrimmages with pads and stuff like that. Uh, and then his knee, I guess, uh, inflamed from there. Now, the, uh, the information that was coming from the ESPN uh, post that we'll have in the show notes included that uh, Barr had had off-season surgery to repair a slight meniscus tear uh, last season. He missed most of the off-season workouts uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with what was said to be a different injury. Uh, speaking of somebody who has had a slight meniscus tear, that fucking sucks. <laughs> there is nothing slight about that. Um... But yeah, that uh, so he's he's dealing with knee inflammation. Hopefully, he will be ready for the actual preseason games uh, that he will uh, uh, that are coming up, as opposed to the Hall of Fame game. You'd have to think they'd be holding him out for that, right? Well, they uh, they didn't indicate whether or not he um, he's he's going to start. He's not ruled out yet for that game. I think the Vikings really did actually want five preseason games. Uh, just because they would give all their young players more time. Like, I think if it was an older team that had just more experience, they wouldn't have wanted that. But they want, I think, more time because of all these young players, and I think that uh, Barr figures into that in the same way. They, they want them to just get as much experience as possible for the season. So I don't think they'll hold them out unless, uh, you know, the knee is still inflamed the morning of the game. So... We, uh, we have to go to the actual training camp stuff. So if you've been waiting for your training camp, uh, if you've been waiting for your training camp recap, this is your time to shine. Uh, first things first, I definitely want to ask you about the long snapper battle. Flames. We've had We've had more emails and tweets about the long snapper battle and why aren't people talking about it than any other position. Let's talk long snappers. So that's a lie. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, the long snapper battle is happening, and uh, the, the outcome of that battle will be very useful to know, and it's an important position that I do not really have the ability to evaluate. And I do truly mean it's an important position, even though... They they literally only play in the most literal sense like eight snaps a game, um, but they're like a really important eight snaps, and we've lost games because of miscues in those snaps. Uh, they've contributed to uh, to to Jeff Locke's uh, performance, which I think we can all agree has been subpar. Uh, they've contributed to uh, to Blair Walsh's uh, inaccuracy. Uh, I, I think that talking about Blair Walsh's inaccuracy is overstating things because, like, he missed two kicks that were blocked. Neither of those blocked kicks were his fault. Uh, and then he also missed, like, a couple of 50-plus yarders, including a 68-yarder. Uh, and so if when you control, if you get rid of the blocked kicks and you get rid of the... or you control for the 50 yarders, he actually did not have that inaccurate of a season. But... His total, like, accuracy percentage is, like, 72%. It was the lowest in the league, and you maybe, maybe don't read into that as much, but some of the inaccuracies can be, can be, you know, driven back to the long snapping of Colin Leffler. Obviously, the Miami game directly attributed to long snapping. Um, so it's important. Like, I, I promise you, it's actually a really important thing that this get figured out, uh, you know, sooner rather than later, and uh, and also get figured out in a way that produces the best long snapper. I I just don't have the ability to find out. I can't. I can if I if I watch games and I'm asked to focus on it, I can do it. But like at camp, I I don't know, man. It, I, I, so, so you're saying it would not be a wise. You're saying there's not a chance that we go out and grab a long snapper from another team or someone who's had experience in the Viking system, like, say, Jared Allen, and just bring him in just to long snap? Like, that would not be something the Vikings would be interested in? I think Jared Allen would retire before he signed as a long snapper. 
Uh, <laughs> he hates it. He's talking uh, like a lot of times about how much he hates it. Um, even though he's like really good at it. <laughs> I was gonna say like the first couple of times <laughs> that he that he did it because uh, he had to do it in, in multiple seasons. Yeah. They ended up uh, like the first time they were like, oh, uh, well, they're gonna have to have uh, Jared Allen come out to be a long snapper. Let's see how this goes. You know, you never know about a, but never know about a linebacker going out and. Oh my God, he lo- that was really good. Yeah, well, he was like the announcers were giving him crap until like, oh, well, he he's actually he's a professional football player. He's really good at this. Yeah, he was a long snapper at uh, at Idaho or Idaho State, whichever one of the two he played for. Uh, I'm sure they're rivals, and I'm sure they're very insulted that I like don't know which one he was at. <laughs> but uh, we're going to get we're going to get emails and tweets from our one Idaho uh, Idaho Idaho listener. Idaho, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, so one of those Idaho schools that's not Boise. <laughs> um, he was there. <laughs> he's the long snapper there, and one of the reasons he was selected uh, was was because he could also be a long snapper. Like obviously, you know, you don't pick your long snapper in the fourth round unless you're New England, but. Uh, one of the reasons he was selected in the fourth round instead of the fifth or sixth round is because he had a, uh, you know, he had long snapping capability. And then you know the Chiefs were like, oh, well, he's pretty good at rushing the passer, so uh, fuck long snapping. Let's have him do this. Uh, that helps justify the bounty that we paid to uh, to trade him from KC. Too. Right. Um, so yeah, so he's a pretty good long snapper, but he's not gonna do that again. <laughs> he hates it. Um, I love it when he long snaps, not just because it's like funny in general, but also because he like punched Ray Edwards in the dick, uh, <laughs> uh, which is awesome. Which he warned him about. And he too. told him like, like if you bowl me over as a long snapper, I'll punch you in the dick. And Ray Edwards <laughs> is awful, and so we did that. And so Jared Allen just followed through. Was like, really, this is your fault. <laughs> Do you think I like punching guys in the dick? I don't like punching guys in the dick. Yeah, that's Brian. That's that's Robinson. That's not me. <laughs> so uh so let's move on from the uh let's move on from that for a moment and talk about the quarterbacks. Um let's talk about Teddy and our uh, our number one backup who seems to be either throwing lame ducks or doesn't seem to have any sort of arm strength at all. Sean Hill? Yeah, well, so Sean Hill, like, just turns it on sometimes, and sometimes he's just, like, he's got arm strength and he's accurate and he has anticipation. It's like watching a promising rookie. It's kind of weird because, you know, Sean Hill is, like, 40 or whatever. Um, But, like, he would just turn it on. He looks like a really good quarterback for a while. And you're just like, where did this come from? You were, like, throwing floaters... Like a minute ago, like literally just like I'm looking at my watch like a minute ago. Like, what? And he throws like two touchdowns and and he fits like these passes in tight windows and you're just like, wait, where did that come from? And then like on the, and the next series after he goes out and then he comes back in, it's just this wobbling floater that takes five minutes to reach its destination and then gets picked off. Like you're just like, okay, yeah, that's, I remember that. That makes perfect sense to me. Like, oh, I remember seeing that and back when you were with the Lions and the Rams and the 49ers. And, oh, that time you were with us, too. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, but, yeah, no, he's a, he's, his anticipation has been pretty good, I think, throughout camp. I think his arm strength has been pretty variable, like I just described. Um, but, you know, for the most part, yeah, no, that's an accurate assessment, that they've been all, like, lame ducks or floaters, and, uh, and you kind of want him to to keep things uh, short. And, he I mean, he'd be a game manager. He's like, you sounded to be a game manager. That's exactly what his skill set is. He has good accuracy and anticipation, but he can't, like, win games for you. And his handoffs have looked uh, have looked sharp. If he doesn't have the arm strength, I assume he has to be working on his handoffs. Yeah, I, I haven't noticed any problems with that. In fact, none of the running backs uh, so far have fumbled at the handoff yet. Uh, Adrian, like, slipped and fell down once, but that's different. That was merely because of a, of a banana peel and a prank. Nothing else. Just so rude. So rude. It was family day. Uh, that's all it yeah. was. It's family day. Um, how is uh, how is Teddy doing? Uh, he's doing pretty well. Uh, people are kind of freaking out uh, because of the reports coming out of camp. No one watching camp is freaking out. I think that's like really important context. No one watching camp is like concerned at all about Teddy. But when you tweet something, you, typically you're reporting something that's like easier to report or is more interesting to report. So you report it in completion when it happens, like an overthrow, or most often an interception. And so 
uh, I think sort of the other end of it, and you know, I I don't actually know because I haven't been like reading other people's tweets. I've just been you know doing the tweeting. But like, I feel like as a recipient of information that you only get like in, in dribs and drabs when people feel like they want to report it. Um, you see like incompletion, overthrow, interception, but you don't see completion, 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 completion. Especially because Teddy's name isn't often attached to completions. It's like fantastic catch by Charles Dodson or, you know, uh, you know, Michael Wallace beats Terrence Newman on an in breaking rat and grabs a catch. And Teddy's name isn't attached to that, so you don't associate the good performance with Teddy. But I mean it's entirely because of Teddy that, you know, Mike Wallace has the catch. Like, yeah, he ran a good route and that's a credit to him. Uh, but you know, he doesn't get the ball until the quarterback throws it to him, and so obviously the quarterback has to see it, one, throw it, two, and three, throw it accurately. And, you know, there have been long strings of completions, like a lot of completions at once, uh, consecutively, without an incompletion in between, that we don't report about because we don't... It's not news, because it's not interesting, because it just keeps happening. And, uh, and, and Teddy has looked pretty good. He's looked efficient. He hasn't looked as aggressive as I want him to be. That's not really an issue. That's more like nitpicky. Uh, he threw two interceptions, uh, you know, just the other day, uh, which which is sort of problematic, and both of them were his fault. Um, but I mean, it's it's not even close. Like if you stacked up the interceptions this year versus the interceptions last year, it's not even close. He's dominating versus last year's performance, and against a better defense. Because remember, almost all of his throws last year were against the second team. And even if they weren't against the second team, which they were, even if they weren't, the defense is undoubtedly better this year because it has Terrence Newman and Xavier Rhodes, and Xavier Rhodes, uh, sort of a better version of him, obviously. And then, uh, you know, you've got a healthy defensive line instead of, you know, uh, one where they have to figure out what to do with the nose tackle spot because the other one got shot. And, you know, the linebackers are a little bit better in coverage. Like, so even if, he, if you're just comparing the defense last year to the defense this year, he's, he's done better. But when you take into account the fact that he threw more interceptions last year against the second team defense, yeah, I think people can just chill. I think he's looked good. I think he's looked efficient. He just hasn't looked, uh, you know, eye-popping or amazing. Uh, and, you know, some of some of Drew Brees' best games are the exact same, where like, there's no individual throw that looks, like, kind of outstanding. But at the end of the game, you realize he threw for, like, 75% and, like, 300 yards. And you're like, when, when did that happen? Uh, so that that's kind of what Teddy has been. He's been really efficient, but in sort of a boring way. And he doesn't have the ugly friends standing next to him to make him look good either, since Ponder has uh, long it's, since gone over to the true. Radio. I haven't had to tweet about how freaking awful Ponder's been. And, you know, honestly, I think, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't say last year's Ponder, because last year's Ponder was just awful, because he just didn't care. But I would, I would say 2012 training camp Ponder was probably better than 2014 training camp, you know, Taylor Heineke. But Heineke is, like, just not interesting to tweet. I just stopped tweeting about him. Um, and so people aren't... But, I mean, Heineke has not looked good. Um, hasn't, hasn't looked good. Is he, he's uh, he's still listed as the third on the depth chart, right? Fourth behind uh, Mike Kafka-esque. That. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Kafka-esque is on Yeah, there. Kafka-esque. Uh, and, you know, Kafka hasn't looked good either. Um, Kafka took uh, some second-team reps the other day. Uh, Sean Hill just didn't take any reps that day. So Taylor Heineke took some second team reps. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Taylor overtook Sean, uh, overtook uh, Mike Kafka on the depth chart, in part because like the separation between the two is not dramatic. But Taylor is younger, and so I think he could theoretically improve a lot more than than uh, than Kafka could. But it, it really doesn't matter. I think uh, you know if the Vikings go down to their third quarterback this year, they're screwed. So whatever. Also, I just checked on NFLShop.com. You can actually get all of those letters in the back of your jersey. So if you are wanting a Kafka-esque jersey, you can get it and can get it now. Yeah, and he went to uh, he went to Northwestern, so I'm sure he's never heard a literary joke in his life. Never once. Uh, let's talk running backs. Uh, how has Adrian Peterson looked? And uh, do you think Jarek McKinnon is going to uh, take the number two spot? Yeah, I think uh, Derek McKinnon has basically solidified the number two spot. I think he's not close. I, I don't know if at the beginning of camp he wasn't the number two. He could have been behind Matt Asiata out of OTAs. But uh, he ba basically every rep he's taken at camp has been at the number two spot. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear. Uh, and the Vikings are already expanding what they want to do with him. They've already had him you know, working with the wide receivers to expand his route tree and work on his route running and, and be 
you know, split out wide. Because, you know, remember last year, Jerick McKinnon did split out wide. Matt Asiata did split out wide. You know, Zach Lyon split out wide. But almost always, like 99% of the time, if not 100% of the time, they wouldn't run a route. They would they would just turn around and wait for the wait for the ball because it was a now screen or a fast screen, whatever you want to call it. Um, not even a bubble screen because you move towards the quarterback on a bubble screen. Um, but yeah, they just turn around and so they didn't run routes. Uh, and and this year, uh, Jarek McKinnon in particular, more than any other running back, is working on running routes. As for uh, whoever is number one in the depth chart, can't remember his name. Uh, he has looked explosive. He's looked really dynamic, and uh, if there's any evidence of, of aging, we're not going to see it until he starts taking hits. Because I think uh, so far, um, you know, I, and and this is with a good set of like really fast running backs on the team. You got you know Dewan Harris and Jarek McKinnon and Joe Banyard. They're all very fast, and 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 Peterson looks fast. He looks fast, decisive, explosive. His cuts look great. Uh, and um, and there's no evidence of his age yet, which is not to say his play won't decline. It's just that we won't be able to see it until he starts taking hits. He hasn't been taking hits yet, and, and so uh, you know the only indications are positive so far. You know, and they say that the easiest way to make people forget about the terrible thing you did last year is uh, is winning, and showing up strong at camp is certainly the first step in that. Jeez. Uh, however, I don't think it was necessarily his fault that the Vikings decided to choose him and a picture of him and his son for uh, for family day. I feel <laughs> like that was in poor taste. That was dumb. That was so dumb. And it's not even the dumbest thing an official NFL Twitter account has done in the past, like, five days. <laughs> Which is pathetic. Uh, no, I mean, it was, it was like, it was... Moronic, obviously. I, I don't know what they were thinking. But then the Tampa Bay Buccaneers went up to them by doing their women don't know football, but we want them to know football. What is a play clock? Red. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, red. And then and that was bad, and that was poorly received, and we thought that was going to be, like, the worst. And then the Colts tweeted out that they were holding, like, a prescription drug drive or something where you, you take, like, your expired or whatever prescription drugs and turn them into the Colts. And it's... <laughs> Bring Jim Ursay your drugs. <laughs> it was just like... Ursay need drugs. It was, it was just like mind-boggling how bad. But that wasn't even the worst... So that was the worst maybe of the NFL tweets, but it wasn't the worst f- official football tweet. Oh, God, what was the college tweet? Vanderbilt. Oh, it was Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt doesn't need your permission. Yeah, so Van- so Vanderbilt just is is in the process of having four of their players go through a rape trial, and they were initially like found guilty too, and so there's like this whole thing. Four football players on the Vandy football team are going through a rape trial, and uh, and like then they tweet out a picture. We don't need your permission, like, dude. So at that point, just claim your account was hacked and be done with it, like. They were hacked, and somebody really was good with Photoshop yeah, right. for a second, and just like yeah. made this cool thing, made a lens flare, like it looked awesome. Yeah, some some dude who's really good at graphic design hacked us, and you know it's possible because graphic design's a computer thing, and hackers like computers. So. <laughs> it seems it, it, it's scary just how plausible it sounds. <laughs> like, oh yeah, he's a graphic design guy. Graphic design guys stay at computers all the time. Sure, why wouldn't they know how to do an SQL injection for a hack? It'd be fine. <laughs> I mean, we fired the guy, right? Like, he's under... We, we had him sign that non-disclosure, right? All right, we're fine. Hooray. We don't need your permission. How Even if this, even if you didn't have four members of your team on trial for rape, how is that a good idea? Like, how did that pass through any committee of people? Like, that should be our slogan this year. Because football players don't have a history or, a, or don't have a... Uh, don't have any sort of... Like perception know. problem when it comes to yeah public perception problem of like rape or aggression or you know Ray Rice beating the hell out of his fiance or something like we don't need permission hey, I, I, I we can we can just Ben Roethlisberger the fuck out of this we'll be fine I mean like I think it's like I think a lot of these I, I I'm being generous but I think a lot of these are just like uh, it's like one guy. 
like a coach or somebody comes up with what they think is a really cool slogan, and then they tell the graphic design guy to do it. The graphic design guy is just happy he has a job, and so he doesn't like. There's like maybe a culture of like people who are in high supply in in a, in a job like working for a football team that is high demand, right? Uh, for for the supply, right? Uh, and and I, I, there might be a culture of them not being able to like question their boss, or like or even worse, what if the graphic design guy is like, I'm not so sure that's a great idea, and the coach is like, Do you want your job? And so he just doesn't. And the athletic department, and the athletic director is like, No, that sounds fine. We don't ask for permission on the on the playing field. That's totally fine. Yeah, I think, oh, I think I think just one coach told the guy to do it. And they, 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 I mean, it's just like it's like Twitter. Why would we run that through a committee? Turns out, like you need somebody to just check your shit real quick. So, kind of along those lines, um, I had actually read something uh, yesterday where it turns out that this uh, that the the WWE has a couple of new female wrestlers, and they decided oh to name God, their little yes. group. They wanted to name them the, the uh, submission the sorority. So su- the submission sorority. Uh, it turns out that's actually the name of a porn. Uh, that is out there that is a bunch of w- naked women fighting each other to, like, until somebody, like, is choked out or tapped out or whatever, um, that, that's put out uh, on the internet. It's a series of videos. Uh, as, as apparently, porn does, yes. As porn does, yes. So, apparently, this spiked their, uh, their Google search, like, exponentially, and their, like, subscription rate went up, like, 35% or something in one night. <laughs> like, wow. Oh, a bunch of people decided to Google it. Oh, a bunch of people decided to like it. So now, apparently, they are going to be sending uh, the WWE a fruit basket <laughs> to thank them. <laughs> like, nobody decided to Google anything. Yeah, definitely if you, like, when you come up with a marketing gimmick, you should just put that into the Google machine. I don't think that that's... You just... Google that, and then you type in the name of it dot com. Does it exist? Like Santorum.com or something. You see if it's a if you see if it's a damaged brand. <laughs> I don't think Rick Santorum had a choice on that one. <laughs> well, but yeah, no, I mean, like Rick, I think you're forgetting that Rick Santorum doesn't ask permission either. <laughs> Assuredly, he does not. Um, I think uh, I think for the WWE, that's not as big of a loss, just because I mean, as as the Subscription spike would indicate there's probably like a lot of overlap between <laughs> between between female wrestling enthusiasts and people who are interested in that. Yeah, in, in like fighting porn or whatever it is, right? It's like they they fight and then suddenly they have sex. Like that's the <laughs> they fight and then they porn. Is yeah. how it works. Well, yeah, I shouldn't say. Or so sex. I've been porn. porn. Yes. So yeah, no, that that like fits. I think. <laughs> So let's uh, let's move on to the wide receiver uh, battles and let's talk about uh, uh, let's talk about Patterson and Diggs for a moment. There was a great article that came out uh, at uh, purpleptsd.com uh, talking about how uh, Patterson is. It looks like he's just not going to be as good as fifth rounder Stephon Diggs. Yeah, no, it's certainly possible uh, that Stephon Diggs ends up seeing more playing time than Patterson. And, um, you know, I, that's, that doesn't, like, bother me or anything. It still feels like a bold statement written on paper, though. It does. Um, Stefan Dix has been having an astounding camp, and obviously that can change. It's obviously, like, a, a camp thing, but, like, you know, usually when we identify, like, a preseason superstar that is, uh, you know like a Jerome Simpson, or worse, like a Stephen Burton, or like a Marcus McCauley, or or even like Adam Thielen, who no one was disappointed with. Um, because he was like the sixth receiver on the roster, and then he became the fifth receiver on the roster. Uh, you know, there's like a question of whether or not that'll translate into a, like real whatever, right? Uh and I think for Stephon Diggs, I don't. I'm not as concerned because those preseason superstars, those training camp superstars, they're often uh, highlight catches. Things are not necessarily replicable. They they happen against bad competition. Stephon Diggs is running excellent routes. He's getting open. He looks good when he's not getting targeted. Uh, he just he just looks um, 
like a complete player who has the ability to contribute, not like uh, like a what a preseason superstar typically looks like. Uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up uh, taking snaps away from Patterson and, and being more significant than Patterson even this year. Uh, I would guess that Patterson has uh, some unique usages and interesting playtime, uh, and and I would guess that that Diggs is going to be restricted by the players who are taking the you know the most snaps, the three most snaps. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if Diggs ends up getting more reps than than Patterson by the end of the year. How is uh, how's Thielen looking? All right, um, he's improved his route running, which is sort of always an issue, I think, for him. Not because he wasn't necessarily uh, hitting the depth correctly, but more because he wasn't necessarily a very like deceptive route runner, and he sort of improved on that. Uh, his hands, I think, were an issue for me last year. You know, a lot of people tied into his hands as a strength. I never saw that. Uh, this year, his hands are a little bit better. Um, at least in training camp, we'll see what happens. You know, in in the preseason. Um, but yeah, I mean, he looks like a better player. Uh, he uh, has improved a lot in sort of the areas of weaknesses that he had, uh, and uh, and I think that he is a, he's definitely um, a depth-capable player for every team in the league. I think every team in the league could use someone like Adam Thielen, so I would be surprised if he doesn't end up making the roster. All right, next up on our uh, big list of people to go through, we want to talk about the line, and one of the questions we keep getting is about Matt Khalil. Is he still on the team? I feel like I didn't see him. Oh, it's not that I didn't see him. I didn't see him play well all of last year. Uh, how's he doing this off season? Yeah, well, I mean, you could be forgiven for uh, for acting like he was invisible because he certainly, you know, didn't get in the way of anybody. He was much more of a turnstile than an offensive lineman. Right. Uh, he has put in what I would think is his worst camp so far. Uh, which is alarming, obviously. Um, but, like, you know, I, I, I saw, you know, some people saying, you know, I think a lot of people are just, uh, yeah, I think they're they're overdoing it in their colloquial criticism because, I mean, he looked bad against Jared Allen his rookie year, right? And it's like, well, actually, you know, that was the cool thing about his rookie year. Even in training camp, he didn't look bad. He looked, you know, all right against Jared Allen, actually. Like, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, but, I mean, it, it's not happening. Every year in training camp has gotten worse, and every year in the regular season has gotten worse. Uh, and uh, and if that means he has gotten worse going into this year, then I think uh, then I think Teddy's dead. Um, I think <laughs> I think we're watching a pre crime. Uh, Is it possible that Matt Khalil uh, that, that Jared Allen is uh, is Matt Khalil's uh, hair if he were to be a uh, Samson like? We got rid of Samson's hair, and now he's he's just fallen as nothing. We got rid of Jared Allen, and Matt Khalil is flopping all over the place and can't seem to stand up and block anybody. That would be pretty great because there's like a level of madness to it because Jared Allen's hair is his Samson's hair. So when he got rid of his hair, he uh, lost all his power, and then when we got rid of him, Matt Khalil lost all of his power. <laughs> um, like a tr- there's a transitive property here that I'm not prepared to map out we yet. We need to feed Matt Khalil Jared Allen's hair. <laughs> is that? Yes. Is, is that where this yeah, is Yeah, well, that's, that's the only logical conclusion. <laughs> I don't... I don't want to be the one to scalp him at, uh, at, at the game, but I feel like somebody's get, some listener is just going to have to get up and do yeah, it. Yeah, well, I mean... They, For the good of the they've team. They've seen Jared Allen rope cattle hundreds of times by now, so they themselves should know how to rope Jared Allen. That seems like a safe and reasonable activity for a human being to engage in. He has been he's been showing this to you for your benefit because he knew this day was yeah, it's coming. It's been a long term hint. Yes. <laughs> that's 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 awful. Uh, how has the rest of the line looked? Uh, much better than, than Khalil. Uh, I think Phil Lodeholt has looked stunning in camp. I think he's looked really good. Excellent. Um, and he might be the best offensive lineman in camp so far, and that's, like, not an issue. Like, normally you'd be like, yeah, that crappy right tackle everyone's complained about for four years is the best one. That would be a sign of, uh, of alarm. But that's not really the case. I thought he's looked really, really good. Um... You know, I thought Fusco's looked pretty good. I thought Sully's looked pretty good. Mike Harris is looking a lot better than I thought he would. Um, 
Tyrus Thompson is one of the guys competing for Mike Harrison's spot. He looked good initially. Now he's not looking sort of nearly as hot. Um, and, you know, those to me in my head are the are the people competing for the guard position. Uh, Joe Berger's technically competing for the position, but it, it just doesn't seem like he has a shot. Now Berger's had a couple of days without pads, uh, so it looks like he's losing his chance to take that spot. Uh, David Yankee uh, doesn't look like he's going to take that spot. In fact, he's looked better at tackle than he has at guard. We'll see. Uh, so I think it's between the two of them at this point, and I think Harris has looked much better than I ever thought he could look at that spot. So, you know, the, the offensive line is probably going to be better for the fact that they're likely not going to be as injured as they were last year. Uh, but, you know, uh, offense is as you know, strong as its weakest link. Uh, and so, you know, Macklow remains an issue. Like, if the rest of the line plays on an all-pro level, and Macklow plays like he did last year but worse, then the offensive line is bad. If the, uh, if the offensive line were all entirely average, that would be much better. Um, but it's not. Um, and so... This isn't Madden. We can't just give him more points and just lose some uh, on, uh, somewhere else on the... Uh, yeah, you the can't team. just subtract points from someone and add them to someone else. Uh, as cool as that would be for the way offensive lines worked. Um, That's a damn Yeah, it sucks. Uh, and so... I feel like we should have been able to get that with the new stadium. Yeah, it's just part of the deal, man. Uh, no, I think... Uh, I think... Uh, I think the electronic pull tabs, uh, you know, haven't provided us with enough resources for us. <laughs> if only more people would have bought electronic pull tabs, Matt Khalil wouldn't have sucked as bad as he is right now. Yeah, man, why do you guys hate the Vikings? You should definitely gamble more in bars with electric machines. You should. Why aren't you? Um... <laughs> that's that's awful. Uh, how is the defensive line looking? How are the uh, how's the defensive line and what's the linebacker uh, uh, position looking like? You know, when when you say the offensive line looks good, I think that the alternative to a lot of people, and I think that this is a reasonable and intuitive alternative, is that the defensive line looks bad. But no, the defensive line looks much better than the offensive line. Uh, Brian Robinson, uh, understandably, has had some issues with the load hold, but uh, I thought. Just in general, Robinson's look good. It's helped that he doesn't have to uh, rush the pass turn every down. He often uh, drops into coverage or, or sets the edge of the run. You know, Either way, it is possible for both Robinson and Lodehold to look good, and in this case they have. I think Linval Joseph looks incredible. I, th- I think he looks, uh, like, astounding. And, uh, you know, like I said, Sully looks good. That is kind of an issue or an indicator of his decline because normally Sully looks Great. I think John Selvitt is a phenomenal center, and uh, and and the fact that he looks kind of averageish uh, is a sign maybe that he's falling off. But it could also just be that Linval Joseph is just blowing shit up and ruining days, and he looks fantastic. I, I, I don't remember him looking this good, even in New York when he was in a scheme that fit him. I thought Shree Floyd looks pretty good. I thought he looked a little bit better at the beginning of camp, but that's not to say he looks bad now. I think... Um, he could be consistently disruptive, which is nice. I think Everson Griffin looks amazing. Uh, there is an issue when evaluating Everson Griffin, which is that he's gone up against Matt Khalil, Carter Bykowski, and David Yankee, uh, and it is much easier to look good against that crew. Um, but, I mean, you know, if he were good, this is what would happen. If he were average, I think it is unlikely that he would beat even bad tackles this consistently. So... It is a combination of the people he's going up against and the fact that he himself is good. Uh, he still has a lot of speed off the edge. Uh, he still has a lot of savvy. I think he, you know he's cutting inside more often than he used to. It could just be because he knows Khalil's really bad at dealing with that. But it's also like an indication that uh, he has the ability to pass rush in different ways, more ways than he did before. The question is whether or not he has the freedom to do that once games start. He has a responsibility to set the edge more in this defense than another defense. But I think this, I think the defensive line looks really good. It's going to be better than last year, and I'd be surprised if the Vikings pull down fewer sacks next year than this year. Yeah, this defense is looking scary. Like, this is this is something that we've wanted for, for a couple of years now, and uh, we, we have something that... Uh, you know, we used to be the team that you couldn't run on. You absolutely could not run on. It'd be nice to see if we could return to that and uh, get a couple more sacks in, too. Yeah, it would be, it'd be cool if we could get to the heyday of the Williams wall again. Um, 
you know, the 2006, 2005 Vikings defense, uh, those defenses were stunning in terms of their ability to stop the run. Um, you know, I don't know if they're going to get there yet, but I think that the overall defense could get to that level. Uh, I, I, it looks good. I, I have issues, obviously, with Blanton and safety. Um, he is average at safety, which in, in a league without very many safeties is a liability. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm worried about Terrence Newman. Not for any reasons I've seen on the field. I think he's looked pretty stunning on the field in practice, but because at some point he's going to fall off the cliff, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happened during the season. I think Trey Waynes isn't ready to fill in yet. Um, even though he's looked better, I think, since Saturday. Um, so that's like a week ago, basically. Um, he's looked good for about a week, but, you know, I, I think he's not ready, and he's still made some pretty significant gaps. So, you know, there's there's issues there. The linebacker situation's not sorted out, even if Anthony Barr is not an issue. I'm still worried about Chad Greenway. You know, who knows who's going to be the middle linebacker. If it's going to be Adi Cole or Eric Kendricks, Adi Cole, if he is the middle linebacker, is playing faster than he has before, and I don't mean, like, physically faster. I mean, he's reacting faster. That's been a pretty consistent criticism of mine of his. Uh, you can see that in sort of the training camp guide I put out. You can see that in previous episodes of the podcast that I was a little worried about his reaction time off the snap. That's a lot better this year, but he's still a liability in coverage. I think if they play Eric Kendricks instead of Adi Cole, then you've got sort of the opposite problem, where Adi Cole is very good against the run. Eric Kendricks, you don't know because of his size, if he has the ability to hold up, but he's going to be very good at pass coverage. So there's still some questions that need to be answered at linebacker safety and cornerback, but I think that the defense as a whole looks a lot better this year than it did last year, and the defense is sort of what helped the Vikings stay in a lot of these games. Uh, should we know anything about uh, what's happening at corner right now other than Josh Robinson being out? and that we're probably not going to be bringing uh, Chris Cook back. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, like I said, like on the field, I think Terrence Newman has looked pretty astounding, and I think that there's nothing that we've seen in camp that indicates that Terrence Newman uh, should not be the starter opposite Xavier Rhodes because he's looked really, really good. He's looked fast, which is crazy. He's the oldest cornerback in the league. Um but he's kept up with Mike Wallace, he's kept up with Charles Johnson, he's kept up with Stephon Diggs, you name it, he's kept up with these receivers that we know... Keeping up with fast. Wallace is something big, too. He's a fast, fast Yeah, fast. he's probably the fastest person in pads in the NFL. And, uh, and, I mean, and there's a couple of times, you know, obviously, where Mike Wallace will beat Terrence Newman, but never to the ball. Like, he'll beat him uh, going downfield on a nine route, but unless the ball is perfectly placed, you know, Terrence Newman always has a chance to disrupt the pass, and he often takes advantage of that chance, and it really disrupts Mike Wallace's ability to be a threat in the red zone, because there's never enough time for him to get enough of a lead uh, for Terrence Newman to be out of contestation. Um, it's only sort of early in 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 the in, in the drive at the 20, at the 30, at the 40, uh, that, that Wallace has enough room against Newman for a very well-placed deep pass to be just completely out of Newman's reach. So, yeah, I think it's kind of cool that, that Terrence Newman still has the ability to do all these things, and it's not just speed. He has quickness and agility, and uh, it looks like, you know, you can't really tell without tackling, it looks like he still has retained a lot of, uh, you know, his strength. So uh, I'm pretty happy with him. I think the the cornerback depth chart behind him, I think for a while we're going to see Munderland instead of Waynes, um, because Munderland is probably going to end up being a better slot corner if he only focuses on the slot then Newman is going to be if he is asked to play both the outside and the slot, and Waynes is asked to play outside, and Newman kicks into the slot. Um, and I think we're going to see that for a while unless Munderland messes up and they're they're forced to change. Uh, and that doesn't bother me because I think Munderland's been playing a little bit better and a little bit more focused and a little bit more assignment sound this year, uh, at least in camp, than he did last year during the season. I wasn't really concerned about Munderland during camp last year. Maybe I should have been. But I don't think I saw anything that indicated that would lead to the problems that happened during the season. So take it with a grain of salt, but it looks like he solved those problems, even though it looked like that last year, too. But I think Munderland is going to be the, the nickel guy, so we're not going to see Waynes on for a while. I think the Jabari prices look really good, um, despite being undersized against a lot of these receivers. I thought he's looked good. Uh, and then sort of the other cornerbacks I'm, I'm a lot more iffy about. Um, Marcus Sherrill's has looked like kind of okay, which is fine for a dime back. But, you know, Marcus Sherrill's is always fighting for a roster spot, so... Are there any looming battles that we should be paying attention to uh, coming up here? Yeah, no, I think you want to figure out what's going to happen at the right guard position. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Mike Harrison, Tyrus Thompson are the most likely big candidates for it, but there's a couple others. 
Like I said, Berger, you know, like Yankee, if he's going to play in the preseason game. Uh, I think middle linebacker is going to be interesting because you can have Audible and Eric Kendricks compete for that, but it's entirely possible that the Vikings field, you know, Hodges, Kendricks, and Barr, or, uh, you know, Kendricks, Cole, and Barr. So, you know, figuring out the linebacker situation uh, overall is going to be important. Um, I think it's unlikely that Chad Greenway doesn't start, but, you know, it's possible. Uh, and then the safety position battle is is, is one that, that's worth watching, too. Blatton has taken almost all the snaps there, but Exum has taken some snaps. Sandeo's looked kind of good recently in camp. Uh, and so, you know, who knows what's going to happen there, but that's that's worth watching, too. Well, if we can uh, we can move on from training camp, and uh, we actually have a game to talk about. Yeah. So, I mean, like, oh sort of. Oh, my. Well, I mean... There will be teams on either side of the ball that will not be playing for the same team. Fans will be in attendance, and it will be happening not in Minnesota. Correct, on both counts. Yeah, so the Hall of Fame game happens this Sunday, and it will feature the Vikings and the Steelers. And uh, I guess the first thing I want to ask you is, do you feel as if uh, should we expect to see people like Teddy Bridgewater playing? Obviously, AP is not, but should we expect to see like Bridgewater and uh, some of the bigger, some of the uh, some of the starters, or should we just expect to see our second uh, second string out there? You know, we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of reps from from a lot of the the first stringers, like you said, Adrian Peterson. No, but you know, we're gonna see. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw two drives from Teddy or one long drive from Teddy. Um, to Zimmer, it's very important to take advantage of the opportunities that he has to play some of these players that are competing for a spot against the first team of another team. And so we're going to see some rotation along the offensive line. Uh, we're going to see a little bit of rotation among the wide receivers just so they get reps against first team or, or starting quality players. And then on the defense, sort of the same deal. You're going to see some rotation at linebacker and cornerback and possibly safety just to see some rotation against a first-team offense. Uh, and so, you know, some of the mainstays like Greenway are going to get fewer snaps, um, but some of the young guys that just need to have more playing time, like Teddy, uh, are going to get maybe a couple more snaps. You know, the last time the Vikings were in the Hall of Fame game was in 1997, and we did go to the playoffs that year. Oh, so it's a trend of uh, one. That's, whoo. Yes, that's, that is that is actually exactly it. It was 1997, and we went nine and seven. Now, now remember, after that they drafted Randy Moss. So I, this is great. This is incredible. Yeah. So, so we're just one Hall of Fame game away from picking up a Hall of Fame quarter or a Hall of Fame uh, wide receiver. Yeah. It's so perfect. just everyone keep that under your hats. So let's just you've you've heard it here first. We're just gonna we don't need to talk much about it. Um. So there's not much of a preview that we can do for this, sadly, uh, since it's a, not only just a preseason game, but it's the extra preseason game. Uh, but from everything we've heard, Mike Zimmer's really excited to have five preseason games this year. Yeah, he seems excited uh, just because it gives him more time to evaluate players in game situations at a, at a moment in, in sort of the roster's history that is, that is relatively in flux. And so, uh, so yeah, I, he seems happy just because he has the ability uh, to get more game tape, as it were, on, on a lot of these players that he's been evaluating in practice. But with such a young team, that's much more important than with a team, like I said, that is, you know, older players or more established players or players where the talent level has been more obvious. Yep. So we should uh, we should expect to see pretty much the same sort of uh, starter lineup for. Uh, for Pittsburgh coming out, uh, I, I, the, the point total that Vegas is putting in is set at 35, and three of the last four Hall of Fame games have gone under that total. So, this probably will not be a high see, high uh, high scoring event. This will most likely just be a nice way to spend your Sunday uh, watching uh, watching NBC and going, oh God, football, it's almost back. It's almost here. Yeah. No, I think that's what's going to happen. I think people have, like, been missing football for so long. What's great, though, is that by the time the second preseason game ends, and I don't mean, like, the next one, but I mean the second one for most teams, 
by the time that one ends, everyone's going to complain about how bad preseason games are. <laughs> like, oh, we've missed football for so long, I do anything just to watch a preseason game. Oh, man, these suck, don't they? Yeah, they're rubbing their nipples against the TV for the for the uh, for the Hall of Fame game and for uh, for week for the for the week one preseason. And like after the second preseason that game, they're like, "Oh God, why won't they hit each other? Why won't they actually do anything? Why are these players the third, so bad?" Yeah, then the third game happens and the starters stay in until the end of the first half. Like, oh, okay, yep, that's right, that's right, that's right. Okay, football's good again. Football's good again. Week four. God, why are all these no-name players on here, and why do they suck so bad? <laughs> why does Tyra Taylor look so good? What's happening? Exactly. So, there's not much of a preview for the game. However, we are pre- predicting a Vikings win, a Vikings route, and Mike Tomlin to be uh, looking at the camera just steel-faced and angry. Not visibly angry, more disappointed. Forlorn that he did not stay with the Vikings. Yes, exactly. He's going to look like that parent that uh, the kid came home late and didn't call, and he's just been sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting in the living room, waiting for the kid to come home. Like, that that's the constant look on his face. Just like, <laughs> so, you should have called. Exactly. He's, he's uh, going to look down at his hand and be like, you know, these rings, they feel so empty now. <laughs> He's, this, uh, this 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 hand it's 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 just so heavy. It's just so heavy. <laughs> let's uh, let's go to the mailbag. We have a giant sized mailbag that, uh, that we ha- that we have this week. The first question and the most important question comes from Darren Page. Darren asks, "How many superhero T-shirts does Arif own?" Uh, when he originally asked that question, it was like four. And now it's closer to six. Did you pick up superhero shirts in Mankato? Well, people were really upset that they didn't have a Thor shirt for the Vikings. So, you know, one of those, and then and Chelsea wanted a Batman shirt that wasn't just a logo, and it fits me. It just happens to, so, you know. So you bought a shirt for your for your girlfriend... Or for, or for another writer? Is that what happened? For, for my, and it just happened. Yeah, for my girlfriend, and then also for me. It turns and then, out it fits you. And then you. the one for my girlfriend is also for me, too. So that's, that's six. I'm not commenting on it. I'm just letting that breathe in the air. Look, man, a lot of players are really into superheroes, so I think this will really uh, develop my rapport and stuff. It's a business investment. <laughs> It's it's a business investment. Yeah, can you write these T-shirts off? I'd like I'd actually I'd I'd like to see that. <laughs> like it, it, a lot of, while a lot of superheroes uh, or while a lot of players may be really into superheroes, I didn't know that a lot of the these people may be sharing shirts with their girlfriend and that they they fit. Well, if you, well, okay. So if I mean if you write something off as a business expense, and then someone steals it from the office. And it's not insured. That's just going to happen sometimes. It just fell off the back of the truck. Yeah. That's all. It's like normal like inventory collateral. You know, the IRS has not been investigating my write-offs too closely anyway, so... You know, if it hasn't happened yet, it won't happen, right? We're, we're, we're writing off that damn MiFi is what we're going to do. It's true. It's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. Uh, Di, uh, Di Murphy, uh, on Twitter... <laughs> who famously hates Marcus Sherrills and cannot say a positive thing about Marcus Wait, Sherrills, really? yes. asks... This is my understanding, or is that... That's, that's the I mean, crap you, that people... You could be right, I just, Twitter. like... I, I've just missed it. No, the crap that people have been giving her on Twitter is that, that she absolutely does not like uh, Marcus Sherrills. Uh, so, she asks, do you think Sherrills manages to make the 53-man roster? Because Diggs sounds like he's pretty legit. Yeah, well, I mean... Diggs hasn't returned a punt in, like, two years in a game situation or something like that, so, like, I would chill on Diggs as a punt returner. Uh, th- I think this might be Cheryl's last year on the roster because Diggs is going to have to continue to learn how to how to return punts and, more importantly, catch those punts. Cheryl's is a top three, I guess if you're pessimistic, top five punt returner in the league. It's not just his average, which is very high, which is actually in the top three of the last two years, or, or top five for the last two, three years. Um, so top three or top five, depending on your range, in terms of just punt return average. Um, but also, all of those people, except I think Darren Sproles, muffed more punts per punt fielded 
than than uh, than Marcus Sherrills. And so he has greater ball security than other people on the list. And uh, he has very good average. He's a really, really good punt returner. I think people are just kind of like sleeping on that fact. Um, it's why, despite two really good punt returns in the preseason from Adam Thielen, the Vikings still made Marcus Sherrills the top punt returner. He's really effing good at it. Uh, and so, yeah, I think he makes a roster. It helps that Josh Robinson's not going to count against the roster in all likelihood uh, for half a year. Uh, because it's going to be really difficult for the Vikings to like try to keep seven cornerbacks on the roster, like I said. Um, although maybe they only keep four safeties, and that'll make it a lot easier. But um, but yeah, I think I think Marcus Shells makes the roster because uh, it, 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 it with with coaches like Mike Zimmer, like field position is really important and ball security is really important, and so you're just less likely to cut. A reliable punt returner. Dix looks really good as a receiver. He looks great as a receiver. As a punt returner, I think, you know, Prefer mentioned this in his presser, he's improved since, uh, since like, rookie minicamp. You know, when I saw him in rookie minicamp, and I thought he's one of the better punt catchers that I've seen not be Marcus Sherrill's in a Vikings camp in a while. But it's true, he wasn't he wasn't as secure with the ball as, as, as Sherrill's is. And he's improved on that. And if he's improved on that enough, that the Vikings are, are happy with his security as a punt returner, as his ball security, then yeah, I think Marcus Schultz is going to have a very, very difficult time making the roster. But I, I think it's going to be really difficult to displace Marcus Schultz as a punt returner. So, Di, you're just going to have to wait to, un- to uh, unpop the cork on the champagne for another year. We both think that Charles is going to make the roster. And he's, like, not bad anymore. Like, people got, like, really upset with him. Because of shit that happened like two, three years ago. Like he's gotten better as a cornerback. He's like he's a pretty good fifth cornerback. So I'm not like that upset about it. He's no Chris Cook. But he's, 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 he's no Chris corner. Cook. He's not gonna have like arbitrarily good games against Megatron and only Megatron. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's go to uh, Parker Fisher, who asks, "Do you predict Yank getting a uh, shot at right guard?" He's lined up at the left guard so far, he thinks. Uh, yeah, a shot, yeah. I think they'll put him in there for, like, a series or two in one of these preseason games. But I think uh, he's sort of out of the running, especially because he actually, like, looks pretty good at left tackle. I was, like, really confused when they put him at tackle because of Carter Bikowski's injury. Uh, and he looked, like, pretty good there. So maybe that's his future. Like, that would not upset me if he turned into, like, a backup quality left tackle. Like, that would be actually pretty tight. Um, yeah. If you turn into like kind of, a starting level left tackle, it'd be on my wildest dreams. That would be amazing. <laughs> You're like, I don't exactly know how we got to this point, but you just keep playing at this position, you beautiful bastard. Yeah, just, and he like played tackle in college, but like what happened was he played guard as a sophomore, and then that was the plan for him as a junior. But then like injuries, and he played like six different spots on in one game on the offensive line. He played every spot at center, and then he played both tight end spots. Um, which is just mind numbing. He didn't do center it, like that. That in where I come from, that's a lack of motivation. That's a lack of hustle. Well, he's played center before too. Oh, just okay. not in that game. If he's going to play every position on the on the line, I feel like he just needs to he needs to bite the bullet and commit. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, and, and he, he ended up playing tackle football. for most of his uh, most of his junior year. Made a consensus All American list at left tackle. And was moved back to guard because Stanford was like, you, I mean, you're a guard. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're better as a guard. And then, and then made consensus all American list as a guard. And in fairness, Andrus Pete was a really good college tackle. And so, I mean, he's first round pick, right? So, uh, it made sense to push Yankee back. But he's really he's a guard, and Stanford recognized that, even though he was a very good tackle for them, he's a better guard. Uh, and. Um, and so it would be really kind of interesting and surprising if he ended up being a better tackle in the NFL. But, hey, man, cool. <laughs> You're like, well, if he just so happens to fit in there, great. Yeah, I was talking to somebody else. Uh, I don't remember uh, somebody who played their final year in college at guard and they ended up succeeding as a tackle in the NFL. It's usually been the other way around. But, I mean, first time for everything. Uh, next question from J Dog Dungan who uh, asks, what are the current Mr. Mankato rankings? Uh, so I don't know everybody who's competing for Mr. Mankato. I suppose I could just look at the Mr. Mankato Twitter account, which exists. <laughs> um, because, of course, that's a thing. Right. 
Uh, doot, 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 doot. Hmm. Well, let's let's take a look at uh, Mr. Mankato, the Twitter account. Let's take a look at the odds they released. So this so this gives us the the all of the people. So there's ads, Babatunde, Ayagbusi, uh, Justin Coleman, T.J. Clemmings, Anthony Harris, Scott Crichton, Daniil Hunter, Anton Exum, Michael Pruitt, and Stefan Diggs. Uh, I think, so those were the pre-training camp rankings in reverse order. I think Stefan Diggs right now is number one. I don't think there's like any question about that. Um, I think number two is probably Daniil Hunter right now. Uh, that that I think I think people can all agree on that, that he's been getting a lot of hype. The hype has been sort of playing out. He's been looking pretty good. Uh, I think number three is... Um, He's a little bit difficult. I would have picked Scott Crichton because I thought he's looked really good, but then he got injured. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm going to keep Scott Crichton there, even though even though he's been injured and, and, and he hasn't played in like the last five or six days, um, because I, I I thought he looked really really good. Uh, after that, I would say uh, Michael Pruitt. Uh, he's had you know some really good moments in camp. Uh, he's you know sort of shined a little bit. Um, after that, I'd say Anton Exum. Um, he had a bad two two day stretch, but I think otherwise he looked pretty good. He's a good hitter. Uh, I thought his his blitzing was was actually pretty phenomenal. He's got some pretty good instincts, and he showed that. I put Anthony Harris next. Uh, he's had some good moments, um, but you know he hasn't really splashed. I mean, he had an interception uh, at, today as of the recording of this podcast, but for the most part, he hasn't been able to move up the depth chart. After that, uh, probably Justin Coleman. Then T.J. Clemmings, and then uh, Babatunde Ayagbusi. Babatunde, indeed. All right, uh, next question is actually a fantasy question. Uh, Britt Kreiss asks, uh, who are good rookies I should attempt to get cheap in my keeper uh, league auction draft in a couple weeks? Like on the Vikings? Um, it doesn't say Vikings, but... Well, you could include Vikings, or you could include any team in the NFL. Uh, I mean... For the Vikings, you're looking for cheap rookies. I think Stephon Diggs is really the only one uh, that I would identify because there weren't that many offensive skill position players that were drafted uh, recently or, or in a position from undrafted free agency to produce. So that would be that would be Stephon Diggs. That's like pretty easy, I think. Uh, I think across the NFL, um, that one's a little harder. Uh, I'll, I can. I, yeah, I could, I could probably do this real quick if I think about it. Um, you see, obviously you want to ignore uh, some of these people that are pretty high up in ADP, so I'm going to take a look at some of the people who are ranked like 40 or so in ADP in Keeper Leagues. Um, I would probably say no to Ty Montgomery. I think a lot of people like Devontae Davis. I don't. Probably no to Vince Mail. Definitely no to Bryce Petty. Uh, no to Brent Hundley. Uh, no to Zach Zenner just because he's behind Amir Abdullah who's been looking good in camp. No to Garrett Grayson. Jamison Crowder at Washington is probably an interesting pickup. Um, so he could be worth investing in. Uh, I would say Malcolm Brown is going to get some opportunities early in the season this year. And I think long-term he might have some opportunities. I'm not convinced that Todd Gurley is going to remain healthy. Um, so he would be good. Uh, I think uh, Deontay Greenberry uh, would be a good cheap rookie, I think, to invest in. Uh, just because, uh, you know, he's going to be in Dallas. Terrence Williams may not turn out. I don't think the depth chart ahead of him is too uh, daunting. And so he's kind of worth it. Uh, other than them, it would be kind of difficult. I suppose if you if you went up to number 30, Clive Walford in Oakland. If you went up to number 28, Josh Robinson in Indianapolis. Not our Josh Robinson, but their Josh Robinson. Um, perhaps the best rookie for value that I'm looking at that's ranked below 20 is Chris Conley in Kansas City because Kansas City is not always going to have Alex Smith, which is good for the rookies. Uh, and good and good for Kansas right. City. Uh, I would have picked Devin Smith from New York, but he's a little high and then he just got injured. Um, so yeah, I, I think Chris Conley is the best value, but I think if you go a little bit further down the list, um, you could pick up Josh Robinson, who's going to take over Frank Gore's spot eventually in Indianapolis. You could pick Clive Walford. Uh, who has, like, a barren depth chart ahead of him at tight end. Um, you could pick Trey McBride. Uh, the situation in Tennessee is kind of weird because of Troy Oak, Greenback, and McKendall Wright, um, and they're both kind of young. Um, but I like him skill-wise, so who knows? 
So yeah, those are, those are the people that I would I would take a look at. Stephon Diggs from Minnesota, obviously, um, would be the person that you pick on the Minnesota roster. But out of the, out of the people who are ranked twenty or below, or thirty or below, or forty or below, those are my answers. You know, Dusty and I were talking about this uh, a couple days ago. Um, I'm about to enter the the draft that I hate the most, that I cannot get out at all. I think the only way to get out of this family draft is to either divorce or die. And I don't know if I'm ready to do either of them just to get out of a fantasy draft. Yeah, that was pretty I had to, uh, for those who read the tweets during this this particular uh, draft every year, it's, it's pretty close. I just I just ran into Tebow guy today. <laughs> I accidentally I went to the store to pick up a new iPhone charging cord, and I saw him at the at the front desk. And I'm like, oh god, all right, let's go do this. And it, literally, he did say that he had his new Tebow jersey ready. Hey, like Meaning he went out. He went out and got an Eagles Tebow jersey. He's ready to does go. He have, does he have like, all of them? Does he have like Denver, New England, New York, Philadelphia? Does he have all of them? I have to assume he also has Florida State <laughs> or Florida. Florida. Like, I have to assume he has Florida. Like I, I just assume that he just like keeps them pressed. Like he may not wear anything else. He probably just wears those. Uh, but we were talking about ways to ruin a fantasy draft. And I wanted to get your input on uh, on a possible idea. Uh, we were discussing it, and I was thinking about just drafting. Because I have, I have a fairly high pick in the uh, in the draft, and I don't have anybody I'm keeping. So I was thinking about just drafting the top six quarterbacks I can get, and just it's a it's a two quarterback league, and just trying to fuck the rest of the league that way. See, that would be. That w- I think that would be an interesting way to ruin the draft for a lot of people. Uh, it's just, it's like tough, especially because of a two quarterback league. Um, it's tough because if you drafted the top running backs, it wouldn't ruin the league. It would just make you kind of bad. Uh, if you just drafted only wide receivers, that wouldn't ruin the league at all. There's so many wide receivers. Um, kickers would sort of screw up the strategy people have, but it wouldn't like ruin their teams or just make their teams better. So I think quarterback is sort of your best option um, to draft six. Uh, and you could just you could just draft them in like in like QB order, right? You could just draft them uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Andrew Luck, Russell Wilson, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, Cam Newton, Ben Roethlisberger. Yep, just 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 go directly in order. Yeah. Just who is the best available? All right, that that's who I'm getting. And right after the fourth one, I want somebody to look at me and go, "Aren't you going to get a wide receiver running back?" Probably. <laughs> I think I think if you look at you know the board, there's going to be wide receivers available at some point. Yet yeah. when it meets yeah, my I mean, value, I, I'll be that you can just look. I'll at be the... starting. Stif- I'll be starting Stephon Diggs at wide receiver. <laughs> but, yeah. I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to cause chaos. I'm trying to get kicked out of the league. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking a look at this, and uh, if you do that, uh, the only good quarterback left is going to be Tony Romo, unless Matt Ryan has like a career year again. And people have to settle with Philip Rivers and Matthew Stafford. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, worst case scenario, I have six quarterbacks on my team, and people end up having to trade me their halfway decent player to be like to sac- to like bring their season back up. Because of course, like Alex Smith is going to like fall off a cliff, and Carson Palmer is going to be brought back into the old folks' home or put behind the barn so he can be shot. Like, it's 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 not a horrible idea, but if I want to get kicked out of the league, no, it's it's true. I think that's probably. I feel like this is the only option I have to get some form of revenge. It's a pretty fun way to get kicked out of the league. <laughs> Why'd you get kicked out of the league? Well, I drafted six quarterbacks in my first six rounds. They didn't figure it out until quarterback four, but they didn't stop me. <laughs> they kicked me out before my last pick. <laughs> it was fantastic. All right, moving on to the uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, let's go to uh, Nate Schatzel, who. who uh, Says uh, it's, it's actually it was an email question. It says fans and pundits uh, debate about where teams can upgrade on pl- on the player side of the ball. Uh, but where do you think the Vikes can upgrade as far as coaching goes? Well, that's actually a really good question. Uh, if you talk about 
adding a coach, that would be a little bit more difficult. We'd have to figure out if Scott Turner and Adam Zimmer are actually good or whether or not like it's just nepotism. So I think those are reasonable questions to ask. Uh, but it's like difficult to uh, to replace Jerry Gray at defensive back. It's like difficult to replace Kirby Wilson at running back. Well, I suppose you could improve there actually. Uh, not that Kirby Wilson's bad or anything, but I mean, that's you know possible. It's difficult to replace George Stewart, wide receiver. Uh, I've, I have no idea about George Edwards as a defensive coordinator, but obviously that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but in terms of like improving coaching skills, yeah, they could absolutely be better at like, end of game situations, like game situations, managing timeouts and uh, figuring out challenges. I think those are all things that coaches could improve upon. Um, but improving the staff... If Marcus Evans is not responsible, the strength and conditioning coach is not responsible for the injuries, then there's not really a, a place to improve the staff that I am familiar with, although I'm sure there's ways to improve the staff that I'm unfamiliar with. Um, and actually, kind of leading into that, the, one of the other parts of the question was, uh, can we now say that this new strength and conditioning program is contributing to injuries on the team with our third uh, pectoral injury uh, in a year? Yeah, well, fourth what I think. Uh, but yeah, um, evidently not. I mean, they, they spent a lot of time researching this after the Josh Robinson injury, and, uh, and only one of them occurred in the weight room, three of them occurred on the field. Um, or like on the practice field or in the in the actual field of play, uh, and uh, and and the one in the weight room was not related to the use of like machines versus free weights. It was kind of like a freak accident. There was like a problem with the rotator cuff before the the pectoral injury had occurred anyway, and and uh, and, and and that was actually the one in the weight room was Brian Robinson, and that was actually the one that was fastest to recover. Brian Robinson already got back into the field pretty quickly after that. So I, they spent a lot of time looking into it, and uh, they tried figuring out what was causing it. They looked at these questions like, you know, is it Marcus Evans' a strength and conditioning program? Is it just like runs and data tend to happen? You know, what, like, what is it? And, uh, and, and from their research, they concluded that it is not Marcus Evans' conditioning program. There's nothing they need to modify in it. Uh, it's just like shit happens sometimes, and it happens in really oddly coincidental ways sometimes. Uh, next question of this is uh, from reports. It appears the Brady appeal will happen in the Minnesota courts, uh, much like the Williams trial, uh, Starcaps uh, trial happened in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, how can Minnesota courts be the appropriate venue for this? Uh, well, so two things. Since this question was asked, it turns out it's not happening in the Minnesota courts, it's happening in the New York court. But the reason it can happen in Minnesota courts uh, is because... Uh, the NFL plays in Minnesota. It can happen in any court, period. And, um, you know, when when there are situations where an employee can sue an employer in multiple uh, districts, uh, they, the, the lawyer representing that employee will often get what's called forum shopping, uh, which is a frowned upon in legal literature, but is also like, if you're a lawyer, you want to maximize your chances of winning. So they go to places where uh, there is uh, a reasonable chance uh, of doing well, and you could, you know, if you go to the Minnesota court, there's a one in three chance that you get assigned Judge Doty. Judge Doty, uh, and it's not, it's actually better than a one in three chance because you can you can, you know, suggest that a judge has uh, has prior experience managing the NFL, which Judge Doty does. Um, I mean, he did the Reggie White case, I think. He did, uh, you know, the Star Caps case. He did, you know, the CBA stuff. He's done he's done a lot of NFL labor stuff uh, over the years. And, uh, and and so that I mean if he, they, if they wanted someone who was um, who was you know uh, potentially sympathetic to Brady they they would they would go there but the NFL had actually filed a claim first in New York and because of that uh, the judge who was randomly assigned the case which was not Judge Doty deferred to the New York one because that's what you should do. Uh, like legally speaking, because you know it prevents forum shopping and stuff like that. Um, but uh, it can legally happen anywhere, and, and it's not inappropriate for it for it to happen in a district court that has a long history of dealing with these issues. Um, it just so happened to be in Minnesota at one point, and, uh, and and because of that, it continued to happen in Minnesota. But it is no longer happening there because the NFL 
uh, sort of saw the potential danger there and uh, cut it off at the pass. All right, uh, next question. Does the purple Kool-Aid taste more or less delicious with your Captain America shirt and Crock-Pot dinner? Way more delicious. Oh, my God, yes. I can definitely feel much more optimistic about the Vikings wearing uh, that kick-ass Captain America shirt and eating some delicious roast beef. I was going to ask if you had any Crock-Pot recipes for our, uh, for our listeners since you uh, brought a Crock-Pot to training camp. And uh, apparently the hotel was cool with this. Well, they, I mean, they didn't really find out about it. I mean, I guess the housekeeping staff was cool with it because they, like, found it cooking and didn't report it. But, um, yeah, it's... How pissed off would you have been to come back to the, uh, to come back to the hotel and the crock pot is missing? I feel like... Like, what level of disappointed would you I'd be more disappointed than pissed because there was, like, some level of expectation in my head that they would not be cool with it and just take it. <laughs> um, so long as I could get it back, I wouldn't be pissed. Uh, disappointed massively. Um, I, I am so happy I did this, by the way. <laughs> well, because, uh, so, yeah, so Crock-Pot recipe, put a bunch of vegetables, root vegetables in particular, carrots, potatoes... Uh, season it. I put some sage in there. I put some, you know, chili powder in there, salt, pepper, um, onions. I obviously I put in there, uh, and then I just put a hunk of beef in there that that is that has a lot of connective tissue, and uh, I salted and, and I, I peppered and I chili powdered and uh, put it in there. I'm trying to envision the other people staying on your floor, going insane. Yeah, that was one of the appeals, actually is that they would constantly smell it and not know where it comes from. Uh, it's like, deal well, with it, man. I, it'd be like, I, I, people like sitting around the pool going, I will straight up murder the person who brought a crock pot in to their room because I just want that beef and potato. And, uh, and that's so good. And then, so I can't just like eat all of it at once because like the point of bringing it is because I'm going to stay for three weeks and I need to like food. Uh, and so then I use the beef in like ramen that I ended up making, and it tasted way better than, like, ramen, because I put the carrots and the onions and the beef in there. Uh, so delicious. And I had, I brought an immersion circulator, too, so I made, like, poached eggs and I put it on top of the ramen. Ugh, so good. So that is how, that is the way you really should go to training camp, is you bring a crock pot, immersion circulator, and, uh, occasionally go to, uh, go to practices, too. Oh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess you have to cover practice. Occasionally you have to cover practice. Uh, next question. Uh, let's go with uh, Christopher Wiley, who asks, would, uh, would Patterson benefit from a moved flanker so he could be used in more in the pre-snap motion? Uh, I think um, you know the Vikings have used him sort of everywhere, so it's like split end flanker slot. And uh, both the slot and the flanker uh, are, are used to motioning because they're already off the line of scrimmage. And, uh, and you don't have to commit, like, illegal formations uh, to do it. Um, yeah, in, in this offense, it doesn't seem like you move from split end to flanker, even though Mike Wallace is, a, is, is, a, is better suited as a flanker, uh, because, I mean, he can avoid press coverage. And because, you know, it's not bad to motion Mike Wallace, of all people. Um, but, yeah, you, you put Patterson behind Wallace on the depth chart, you're more likely to give more flanker slots, but... I, I think um, he is physically a prototypical split end, so if he learns how to get off the line of scrimmage, off of press coverage, and release well, that's not that much of an issue. But it does limit your options to use him as like a decoy or a gadget or whatever. Um, ultimately, it doesn't matter because the receiver positions don't matter as much in, in the way North Turner uses them. But yes, I think that his skill set is best suited for the flanker spot because you have the ability to do rocket motion, orbit motion, jet sweeps, etc. a lot easier. Um, but it's I would rather have Mike Wallace as a flanker with less of those options and Kip Cardinal Patterson as a split end than the other way around because I think ultimately even as a gadget, uh, Mike Wallace is just more effective. Yeah. Uh, next question is also about uh, Mankato. Uh, Keith Myers asks, uh, how bad is the food up there? Um, 
It's not so much bad you were as really bad upset as the other day that there was no like Chinese delivery. That was nuts. That blew my mind. I like called the front. Uh, so I was so I Googled it. I was like Chinese delivery in Mankato, and then I went to Yelp, and then I went to you know some other places, and there's like no place that did Chinese delivery. And I was like this. Impossible. Like, there's no way a city this large, which is not like it, it's not like an enormously large city, but it's a college town, and uh, and it's like it's still like a city. It's not like a town. Uh, if Crookston, which has like five thousand people on a good day, has two, I would assume that Mankato ha- would have one. Right. And so I called the front desk. I was like, "There's no way." And this is actually how I called the front desk. It was like, "Hey, Holly, it's the front desk." I was like, "Hey, Holly, it seems to me that there is no." Chinese delivery in Mankato. There's no way that's true. That's like how I asked her, and she was like, uh, "Well," and I was like, "You, you, you kidding?" Yes, there's no Chinese delivery. If you want to, you can do like a bite squad thing. They, for them, it's SSDMankato.com, which was fine. I did it, and I paid like a lot extra for delivery, but that's what they do. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's stupid and dumb. Uh, people like Jake's Pizza a lot. It's okay. Uh, Pagliai's Pizza is pretty good. Matt Khalil's Pizza Place is surprisingly good. The the food is, like, not bad. There's a Greek place not too far from the hotel that I kind of like. It's a chain. There's a Chipotle. There's a Noodles. There's a Jimmy John's. It just gets, like, repetitive. Like, it's all the same food. Uh, it's, it's there are 8 million pizza places or a Chipotle or a Noodles, Right. Uh, and so I got bored of it kind of quickly, but I'm glad I brought a lot of my own food. Otherwise, I would have like been driven stir crazy. So it's not bad; it's just like monotonous. Yeah. Um, on, a, on an unrelated note, but still somewhat related to Mankato, uh, did you read the Chris Cluey uh, article in uh, in Deadspin? Oh, it was amazing! Week? There's two things in there that, that have to do with the Vikings specifically. One of them was about Mankato. The other one was about the pre-game meal and pre-game yep. day snack. So, so the first thing I want to talk about is the is about Mankato and the fact that the Viking uh, coaching staff would remind the players every year that Mankato was the STD capital of Minnesota. Yeah, it's a stank hole. That's what they kept on. <laughs> Can we get independent confirmation that, not that that's true, but that people like the coaches have been saying? <laughs> <laughs> Cluey told me to ask Eric Sugarman. I've yet to do that. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, he's like, no, as as Shugs, he uh, he's the one that gives a speech every year to these players about STDs. Uh, you know, because like if you're a player, it's like not that hard to get laid. Good to know. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the uh, first one is that the STD capital, and you know, despite you know uh, the Vikings providing like free protection to the players and all of this advice, and you know, just don't get an STD type advice. It happens every year, I guess. Uh, so that's yay! Thanks for that, Chris. Now that I know that, <laughs> it's one of those knowing is half the battle. I feel like that was almost said more for the uh, for the journalists, not because it's a juicy tidbit, but just so the journalists know. <laughs> right, because they have a risk of getting laid all the time. Uh, it's, it's it's a journalist thing. I'm surprised you're not jumped at the site like, oh my god, it's a reef in his. Is that a new Captain America shirt? <laughs> Let's tear it off of him as quickly as possible. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that sweet the thing flesh is, underneath. I, I think we could have gone without that alliteration, but I think we can move on. Uh, the, the next thing that was brought up from that, from that article uh, was the pre-game meal and how Adrian Peterson is apparently not human. Yeah, so... so Which we takes, knew, but this is just a new one. He takes level. one of those, like, cardboard takeout trays, you know, that you can, like, find at any restaurant, and he goes to the buffet, but he doesn't do anything in the buffet. He just fills the entire thing with ice cream. Then he just drops all sorts of fudge on it, then he puts, like, eight chocolate chip cookies in it, and he eats the whole thing, um, despite the fact that it could just, like, knock you out from all the sugar. And uh, then he runs for, like, 80 million yards the next day. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say he had a bigger... I want to say, like, in my mind, that he had a bigger meal the day before he nearly bro- broke the record. It's like, I, oh, I need one more cookie. <laughs> right. One more that cookie would be great. the deal breaker. If he, like, I just need one more. cheated and got another cookie. And then, uh, and then he runs for 
for just under nine yards of what he needed. Exactly. That's that's all he that's all he needed to do. Uh, last question, and, I, and uh, Eric Carlson at Annoying Fan believes it's the only question that matters. Have the Vikings uh, plotted out the parade route uh, yet for uh, for January? No. Or for February? Yeah, no, absolutely. They, they know exactly where they're going to go after they win the Super Bowl. Or to cure cancer, both of those would be the parades that they... <laughs> both of those would be parades that they'd be both, that they'd be equally likely to? Aw. Oh. Well, not equally likely to, but it... Uh, be like, yeah, they're going to go up uh, 35W and then just get stuck. <laughs> and then crash in the Redskins bus. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is, uh, that's it for the mailbag, and I believe that is it for the show. Wow. We, uh, we stuck through it. It's, it's a thing. We, uh, we managed to get this out. Uh, that is uh, that is going to be it for uh, for Norse Code. Arif, do you have anything to plug? Nah. Things. Go to the Daily Norseman dot com and uh, and read some more uh, uh, and read some more training camp uh, notebooks. The the Norseman has actually had a lot of great articles over uh, over training camp about uh, about breaking news and about uh, their contributors appearing on different shows and podcasts. Please check that out. If you Yes, you would like to subscribe to us. You can do so do so through iTunes. Uh, you can also uh, donate to the show at NorseCodePodcast.com. Uh, you will find that the shows are posted at uh, the NorseCodePodcast.com and on the uh, on the iTunes page a lot quicker than they go to the Daily Norseman page. That's just the price of, uh, of doing business. Uh, so that will be put up here uh, shortly. Uh, also, if you would like to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Norse Code DN. Uh, you can go and follow Arif at Arif Hassan NFL. You can follow Dusty at Dusty O'Connell. You can follow myself, James, at Big Mono. I think uh, I think this has been a show. I think we're finished. So, on behalf of Reef, on, ha- on behalf of uh, Dusty, who's on assignment, uh, my name is, uh, is James Fogosnik. I'm your producer and host. And our formula is this. You better watch out for digs. We will see you next week. Yeah, that was a pretty terrible way to end. Do you have a better one? <laughs> that, was, that was a comment, <laughs> not a suggestion. Norse Code is the official podcast of the Daily Norseman SB Nation blog and is produced with cooperation from Pompous Jerk Productions. Pompous Jerk Productions. Attitude with attitude. The opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of their contributors and do not reflect official positions of the Minnesota Vikings, SB Nation, the Daily Norseman staff, or PJP. No information in this podcast should be construed as gambling advice. Please obey all local gaming laws. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth.